Hey guys, Cell here, and welcome back to some more Sweetest Monster. Let's get started. Her breasts are small, but much like the rest of her body, but they feel soft, pressed against my arm. I don't know if she noticed, or was that her intention all along? Her bare arms are exposed to the biting wind, the falling rain, but she ha doesn't shiver. Her body is cold, but it feels yielding at the same time. For all her talk about being a spirit, a demon, a monster, she looks like a young girl to me. She's so short, I could just rest my chin against the top of her bobbed black head. She must be round about the same height as Melly, give or take a few inches. I want to be with you all the time. I want to help you as you help me and give you a shoulder to cry on when things get tough and a smiling face to congratulate you when things go well. I wouldn't be alive without your sacrifice, so I belong to you now. I'm all yours. Alright, cat girl achieved. But what? Finally achieved cat girl status, alright. What does she mean, all yours? Humans aren't objects any one person can possess no matter what marriage contracts would have you believe. Though Sally shares my last name on legal documents, she still publishes her translations under her maiden name. We've been married for almost two decades, but we do not belong to one another. I couldn't force Sally to obey me even if I tried, which I haven't because I like to think that I respect her. You don't. But respect doesn't count for all that much when neither of us particularly likes one another. Belle isn't a human anyway, she's not even a cat. I don't know what she is. Maybe there are different rules in regards to possession when it comes to non-human entities. If there are, I wouldn't know. I've never met a spirit before. Good to know we have now. Let's get to it. You heard me. I want to devote myself to you, my entire being. My each and every eyelash belongs to you. And the dirt beneath my fingernails and the teeny tiny bones inside my toes. Okay. I wouldn't be able to appear before you in this body if you hadn't saved me. Uh, so I owe you. I owe you a lot, in more ways than one. Without you, I would not even be alive. The cold wind makes me shiver. I should have worn my coat. Why didn't I wear my coat? I must have been in too much of a hurry. The argument I had with Sally made my blood boil. I needed to escape before I suffocated. The cold air was good for me at first, it cleared my mind, but now I feel uncomfortable. Alright. She's standing close, far too close. She smells of the rain, her hair sticks to her forehead, and her breasts are still pressed against my arm. It's cold, but I'm starting to feel warm, uncomfortably warm. So. Oh! Belle's green eyes flash like the colored bands trapped inside glass marbles. One more thing, I'm still rather weak, I can maintain a human form, but I can only use it for a short while. Human bodies are difficult to materialize into being, even for a spirit such as myself. You're so intricate like Grandfather Fox. You'd never think it, but inside here... She taps her chest, but I don't think she's telling me to stare at her breasts, what little she has. Rather, she's imploring me to look beyond that, right past her skin into the inner workings of her alien, unfamiliar body. There's so much stuff going on all the time, so many organs and muscles, and so much blood. My whole body is tethered together with cord and wire, run by electrical impulses, neurons firing in the brain. It's very hard to focus on maintaining such a precarious, delicate existence for so long. It's exhausting if I let my guard down for even a moment. I just disappear into thin air, like a candle being blown out. I've never heard anybody talk about the human body in such an impassioned way. It's strange since Belle isn't a human herself. Maybe that's why she's so eager. People always get interested in the unknown. Why else do so many people both long for the good old days? We always do it, nostalgically hearkening back to past we did not even enjoy at the time. The grass is always greener. Everything becomes more attractive at distance. 
even the final workings of the human body. Perhaps if I was not a human being, I would also find the respiratory system endlessly fascinating. Wasn't being a cat just as difficult? They have lots of little bones, too. Hmm. Being a cat was difficult, but I grew used to it. A few decades will do that to you. Being a human, however, is rather new. I need some time. You've not assumed a human form before? Even as I ask the question, I feel myself wince. My left eye twitches. I must sound like a, such a fool. This isn't the kind of thing I should say. This, this course has no place in civilized conversation. The kind of fanciful dialogue that might exist in a young adult novel or a TV show, but real life? My life. Not a chance. But I still ask all the same, and Belle responds in turn. She doesn't even blink. Of course I have. How else would I know how to speak? It all comes with practice. Like riding a bike? Yep. Once you've done it, you don't forget. But it's been a while. Fine a while. I can't. Spirits live longer than humans, so my perception of time is a bit off. But if you had to guess... I don't know, the last time I was a human was maybe 40 years ago? I've been alive longer than that, longer than you could imagine. Wow, um... I don't know what to say, should I turn it into a joke? That might be for the best if I don't want to go insane, assuming I haven't already. I don't know if I feel comfortable about this, I should probably ask my mother for permission before I start chatting to such an old lady. That was rude. Belle giggles and swats at me playfully like a cat batting a bird's carcass. I see she wasn't lying when she said she'd been a cat for so long. I'm surprised she hasn't tried to lick me yet. Hmm, interesting. Let me go over that later. Or herself. Ah, I'd love to stay and chat, but I feel myself getting faint. I might have to take my leave soon. But this won't be the last time you see me. I'll make sure of that. With that cheery exclamation, Belle stands on her tiptoes and plants a small kiss in the, on the tip of my nose. The gesture is unexpected and strangely sweet. I stare at her stupidly. Alright, Robin. I'll see you soon. Much, much sooner than you may think. Hee <laughs> hee. I'm not sure if I should take that as a threat or not. And what's with that? <laughs> she isn't a cute schoolgirl, no matter how hard she tried. She isn't even a girl at all. She's a spirit. Something vague and unfixed like a breath of air. Do spirits have genders? Did she assume a female form as an act of whimsy? A silly joke? I wonder. But I don't have the time to ask. I blinked once. Twice. And Belle has already vanished, the back melting into the surrounding darkness. Alright, we haven't gone crazy yet. I don't think we have, at least. I collapse against the railings of the bridge, sapped of strength. The iron bars are cool against my back, but my face feels hot. My nose tingles. I can still feel her lips pressed against it. That soft and girlish kiss. I hold one hand against my nose gingerly as though it belongs to somebody else. A different man. A better man, perhaps, whose wife still loves him and whose daughter does not hide in her room every time he comes back home. Ah. Uh, why am I thinking about Melly now? About Sally? Maybe it's guilt. It's because deep down inside, though I tried to tell myself otherwise, I'm happy such a pretty young girl kissed me. Of course I am. Of course. It's not like we want her to do anything else to us. Despite the falling rain, her body really was warm. When I return home, chilled from the wind and soggy with rain, I discover that the lights in the house are off. Sally must be asleep. I'm not sure about Melly. For all I know, she could be curled up in her bedroom, turns her on, reading a book, or searching the net with her old laptop. Or maybe she's just sitting there, staring at the ceiling, cursing me silently. I have no idea. I really don't know that much about Melly, do I? 
How on earth did we become so estranged? We're father and daughter. She's my flesh and blood, but she might as well be a stranger. I wish I could shrug it off with an oh well. Sometimes I can, but it feels far too pressing right now. Far too depressing, more like it. Ah, uh, far too depressing indeed. I open the door and step inside, closing it behind me with a soft click. I don't want to wake anybody up. I even tried to stifle the jingling of my keys, though I doubt that small sound would be enough to rouse anyone. I'm just trying to be considerate. Some people would call that overcompensating. I lean more towards cowardice. I don't want to get drawn into another row. I don't turn the lights on. Instead, I grow Rope my way up the stairs in the dark, one hand on the wall, and the other on the banister. Sally scolds me when I brush against the wall with my fingertips. She says it will stain their paint. Beige paint. The carpet is beige, too. Why don't we decide to carpet the stairs in beige? It shows every single speck of dirt, no matter how minuscule. And a tight-lipped Sally has to vacuum each and every step, all 18 of them, every other week. Maybe I should feel guilty for not cleaning the house more often, but Sally does work from home, unlike me. She has more free time. Besides, she was the one who decided on the color scheme. If she likes beige so much, she can have it, but she's the one who has to deal with it. Damn, I really am cold, aren't I? So much for trying to be courteous. Why did I bother leaving the lights off? I should have flicked them all on, and tramped up the stairs with my shoes stamping on each step for good measure. I like to think I'm a decent person, but I'm not always sure. I can be pretty selfish at times. At least, Belle likes me. That might be a small cons consolation if I wasn't beginning to doubt whether or not she actually exists. Maybe I've gone insane, is that where Melly caught it from? It could run in the family, great. Aunt Clarice was definitely a few cards short of a full deck given she had all those cats. Hey man, don't knock cats. I let myself into bed, my bedroom, no, not my bedroom, mine and Sally's bedroom, and shrug out of my jacket silently, Sally doesn't stir. I can see her lying underneath the covers, curled up on herself, a lump that rises and falls in the dark. She's lying on the left side of the bed, resolutely facing the wall, does she still not want to see me? Sally looks the younger when she's sleeping, her blonde hair is loose, free from her bun, falls over her pillow across her face. Her pajamas are strangely cute for a woman one year shy of 40. A demure white nightgown like something a student at Mallory Towers might wear. All of a sudden, I'm run through with a sharp stabbing sensation. Guilt. I'm sorry for being such a lousy husband, Sally Pally. You deserve better. She doesn't respond, of course. She doesn't. Apologies don't mean it all that much when you forget to say them out loud. Well, of course, if you don't say them out loud, how are they gonna know? May 12th, Wednesday. Alright, what's next? The breakfast table is quiet. The following morning, shafts of sunlight divide the table in two. Me on one side, Sally on the other. Melly isn't here, she hardly ever is. I know that, but I still ask. Why isn't Melly here? You know why. Sally sighs, setting her newspaper to one side. It crumples and face the face of a UKIP politician flashed across the front cover, distorts his head, collapsing on in on itself. It's because she doesn't want to talk to you. I nod, taking another sip of my coffee, try and play it cool. But just discussing the fact that my only daughter probably doesn't love me anymore. But truth be told, has she ever loved you? Is she already going to school? A nod. Is this the silent treatment? How much, uh... Melly didn't need to do that. I'd give her a lift if she wants. Melly's school, St. Catherine's, is only a short walk away from Wheatcroft Juniors. That's probably why Melly refuses to let me drive her there in the first place. Having a primary school teacher as a father, and not just any primary school teacher, but a music teacher, must be embarrassing, especially when I had the pleasure of teaching most of her school friends only a few years ago. Not that Melly has any friends, if she does, I've certainly never met them. Damn! Father's harsh. 
Melly doesn't like asking for favors. She keeps herself to herself. Alright. Especially when I'm around. I can't really blame her for that. Oh, that stings. It's in a little too early in the morning for caustic comments. I apologize. I'll try to rein my acid tongue in until at least half five in the afternoon. Thank you. It would be pre appreciated. I laughed dryly and set my mug off of coffee down on its coaster. Sally always gets mad when I forget to use one. Depressing though it may seem, today is a normal day. Sally and I at the table, embalmed in our own respective silences. It's been like this for a good year or so. There's no reason why it shouldn't be like this now. Even though the events of last night were so fantastical, they may as well have been a dream. Perhaps they were a dream. Nothing seems to have changed. I get to my feet, depositing the cup by the sink, my car keys jingle in my pocket. I'll be going then. Have a good day! Sally's looking at the newspaper again, holding it in both hands so the broad sheet threatens to swallow her whole. She doesn't look back at me. How cruel! What if I got into an accident on the way to work? What if I died? About five people die on the roads every day in Britain. Those are indisputable facts. I could be one of those statistics someday. But Sally doesn't seem to care. Maybe she'd be happier that way. I'm sure Melly would. Jeez. As I walk out the front door, shielding my eyes from the intrusive sunshine, I think about Sally. I think about Melly. I think about myself and sigh a deep, self pitying sigh. Ah. <sighs> Meeting Bell last night must have been a dream, some form of escapism. I b bet most rapidly approaching middle-aged men have fantasies about young girls finding them attractive. What other purpose do those raunchy calendars with half-naked women have, if not to stroke egos? Where's that calendar, man? Where is it? Sally always says men are disgusting. I must be too, having a dream like that. At least I don't think Marmite, unlike Sally, now Marmite really is disgusting. Exposed to the light of day, my hazy recollections of some ten hours past are distorted. I can hardly remember what the girl looked like, other than those eyes. Those bright, burning eyes. I shake my head. It never happened. It was just a delusion. I dream of better things beyond my humdrum job and arguments with my wife. I should be old enough now to know better. I should be. But that doesn't mean I am. Like the morning, the day passes without the bent. My year four group after lunch were particularly obnoxious and Heather Chambers ended up in tears after Cody Bamber made a disparaging comment about her mother. Something along the lines of her being a prozzy? But that was fairly standard. You get used to that stuff when you've been a teacher long enough, it dis desensitizes you. I did feel a bit sorry for Heather though, she's a sweet kid and she doesn't deserve it. I think it must be her red hair, it makes her an easy target. Where do kids even pick up such vulgar language, they're only nine. I didn't go around calling my classmates mothers prutzies. When I was a kid, I was outside playing with my model aeroplanes. I blame the internet. Of course I do. I'm getting old and that's what all old people do. Blame the internet, man. The evening passes in a similar fashion, dull, monotonous, and completely predictable. I see Melly for all of ten minutes when we sit at the dinner table for an awkward meal. Sally tries her best to instigate conversation, but Melly keeps her head ba bowed, half submerged in the oversized folds of her hoodie, and replies with vague, mm, mm. She looks tired and keeps rubbing her eyes. I wonder if she'll pitch forwards and end up face first in her mashed potatoes. I'd like to see that. I hope she's getting enough sleep at night. That's what she has the melatonin for. Joan Fowler said it would help. I thought I'd trust Joan Fowler. It starts to get dark. I find myself sitting in the living room with Sally, staring at some insipid show on TV without really watching it. Sally and I sit together, but we don't talk. We hardly ever talk. Not unless we have something to complain about. How did this happen? How did we let this happen? A 
but maybe it's not just a case of letting. Maybe this is what awaits all marriages somewhere along the line. The Halshin honeymoon period followed by disappointment, dividends, and gradual decay. The thought is so depressing it's enough to rouse me from my sleepy stupor. My subconscious shifts guiltily. I know I shouldn't, but I keep thinking about her. I want my Kako. My Belle, where is she? Come on. Was I so desperate for something, anything, to see me from this rut that I started hallucinating? There's just no way Great Aunt Clarice's cat could really be a cute girl. No way. Am I going crazy? Is this what a midlife crisis feels like? Hey, Sal? Hmm? She makes a small noise, registering my words, but she doesn't reply, not properly. Am I that undeserving of her attention? That stings a little, Sal. I'm going to make a coffee. You want one? Oh, sure. Milk and sugar, right? She nods. I've been married to her long enough that I don't even need to double check, but I do it all the same. I feel like I have to. Suddenly, terrifyingly, she feels like a complete stranger. How suddenly and terrifying. Isn't that what always happens with her? Sally might be my wife, my Sally Pally, but how well do I really know her? I know that she giggles like a kid on helium when he prod her belly button, and I know she has a mole on the underside of her right foot. I know spicy food makes her nose run, and I know she saw Reese six times when it came out in the cinema when she was a girl. I know how she makes the white sauce for our Christmas puddings, a secret recipe she guards jealously from the rest of her family. I know she takes her coffee with milk and sugar, but at the same time, I feel like I don't know anything about her at all. Right, I'll get it for you in a sec. Thanks. No problem. Our interaction sounds casual, completely natural, but it still makes me feel tense. We were having an argument this time yesterday, even about Arabella. Of all people, Arabella sodding. What day? I still can't say that. Are we going to pretend that never happened? Maybe that's why Sally's ignoring me. Maybe she's mad at me. Alright, you guys, we'll find out if she's still truly mad at us next time. Till then, see you later.